Hey guys, Parker Curtis with Homegrown Cannabis Co. here in the greenhouse with another weekly update. I'm here with my friend Matt Gates. He's written for High Times and Skunk Magazine. Why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Matthew Gates. I've been in the cannabis space and IPM space for about 12 years now. And uh, I've worked with various pathologists and other sorts of people to uh, focus in on cannabis pests in general. Well, we got lots to, lots to see and lots to choose from around here. So things that I see are, uh, I've been dealing with caterpillars, thrips, a bit of mold. So we're going to be kind of scouting the greenhouse right now and looking for problems. I know we did see this guy over here, and this is after multiple treatments of BT. But this thing is happy, healthy, munching on the buds there. So yeah, kind of scouting and pulling these things out. This is kind of my daily routine. Let's pull this guy. Oh my gosh, that's a nice bud too. He's just getting in there. <laughs> so what kind of caterpillar is that? So this looks like something in the Helicoverpa genus, which is the uh, budworm uh, moth larvae. There's a few different ones that seem to attack cannabis. You can't really tell exactly from the larva stage, but uh, if I had to guess, it's probably the corn earworm. Yeah, we, we had a bit of a discussion about uh, treatments for these. Uh, we talked about a physical barrier seems to be the best way to keep these out. So I'm planning on tightening up the greenhouse for next season. But aside from that, I've been spraying with BT multiple times a week since early on in veg. And I know they're attracted by the terpenes and when they start to flower. So um, yeah, they're, I mean, they seem to be a little resistant to the BT and I've been dousing these things relentlessly. Yeah, there's a few things about the application of BT to maximize its effectiveness. One of them is, like you said, to apply regular times. A lot of people think that they can just apply once or maybe twice, but there's a whole season. So even yeah. if you got a few in the beginning, there's more adults to come afterwards. Yeah, exactly. Because you have, they have a short uh, lifespan. So they, you get multiple waves of caterpillars and butterflies and all that. So it seems like you have to, especially down here in Southern California, we have a very long growing season. So, you know, you may get the first batch, but they seem to just keep popping up and it's very frustrating. <laughs> and one of the ones over here, I, I know I posted this on my Instagram, but this was where one of these worms had burrowed into the stock and you can see the, the frass in there. So one of the problems I'm having with these damaged sites are secondary mold infections. It like compromises their immune system, the plants, right? Definitely, because a lot of the damage does come from the larva, but at the same time, um, it's the waste that it produces. They can sometimes get infected and the wounds can also be infected by themselves. Yeah, so I, I've been trying to, I'll spray my BT in the morning and then um, part of my IPM rotation is I'm spraying a organic fungicide too. And I'm doing that in the evenings to try to, you know, kind of get in there to some of these damaged sites. And I've been seeing a bit of powdery mildew with all this, uh, you know, humid summertime. So, uh, you know, have, having kind of a varied IPM and be able to see problems and adjust your routine based on, on, on what you're experiencing and seeing seems to be an important part of growing. I would agree with that. You know, speaking of which, yeah. uh, right here I see some damage from thrips. Oh. It looks like that's the case. It's got this sort of like scraping damage that they produce. This is a pretty heavily sort of affected leaf. They're not always this extensive. Well, yeah, it's, you know, part of, part of managing a, a garden there's, it's not gonna be completely sterile. You're gonna have bugs no matter what. So uh, what I've found is, you know, not every, not every problem needs a solution. It's how far are you into flower? How bad's the problem? Is it, uh, like, w I know we'd had a discussion earlier about species that typically are beneficial, but in higher concentrations, it can become a problem. So it's kind of um, rolling with the punches, and, you know, scouting the garden daily and figuring out what needs to be addressed. So I have, um, as we talked about with the physical barrier, the, the plants inside the greenhouse seem to have it a, a lot, have been affected a lot less than the ones outside the greenhouse. But even still, these, these butterflies or moths get in and I saw a bit of damage here. We can crack this thing open. You can see where it's starting to kill the top of the plant. It's a very, uh, very common sign for this kind of organism. Where did that thing go? So I can see some frass there. 
Hmm. I feel like it might be more con. Oh. There it is. Yeah. There we go. These things are tough to find, especially the young ones. They, they're super small. They're tough to spot, but you can see the damage pretty early on. There is research out there that shows that uh, specifically these larvae of these moths are really good at getting resistance traits for various pesticides out there, even things you would never want to apply on a cannabis, mm. as well as things like the cry proteins that BT or Bacillus thuringiensis produces. Um, yeah, I mean, that goes for a lot of different organisms, whether they're bacteria that uh, you know, uh, are in wounds that humans have or organisms out in the garden. Uh, with exposed or with uh, continued exposure, they can get resistance to things. And here's one of these things. I think that's one of those wasps that you say eats caterpillar larva. Oh yeah, I see it right there. It looks like some kind of, um, maybe it's a paper wasp, potentially? Well, they're carnivorous yeah. and predatory, right? So they will tend to kind of prey on smaller bugs in the garden. So that's a good sign, at least. <laughs> that is so, true. So let's go out. I have a few plants outside that were hit a bit heavier with the, the bugs this season, and we're having some secondary mold. So we can check these out and kind of come up with a game plan. Watch your head on this again. So, got a couple of plants here. This one, you can really see this thrip damage here. This, um, but they don't really affect the buds, right? It's just kind of um, eating the chlorophyll off the fan leaves and you get kind of um, a reduced vigor with these plants and it just kind of, kind of slowly saps the life out of them, right? Yeah, they're not what I would call a, um, like a super problematic pest when it comes to how much damage they do. They're not going to typically be lethal to the plant, but right. certainly it can reduce the cosmetic appeal. And if you're, you know, growing plants to then sell to people, obviously they're going to notice that. Also the thrips, you know, like you said, that damage does reduce photosynthetic um, ability. So a really big, dense uh, oh. population will really cause problems. There you can see that's the like molting of it, the, sh the shedding of a thrip. Actually. Or is that a live one? I'm not sure that's a thrips um, molt. It might be, I think that's mm. something else, but I think it's in the hemiterin group. So one of those sap suckers. It, it can be kind of hard to diagnose the problems. I know last season I had what I decided were rust mites, and it took me months to figure out what was going on. So, you know, there, there are sprays that, that are available that will affect the, the bugs that are damaging the plants, but can it kind of keep some of the beneficial species alive. What uh, would you suggest that I be spraying? Because right now I'm using plant therapy, regalia, and BT. There are a few things that you could apply. Um, Generally speaking, uh, when it comes to using like pesticides and things like that, you have to be very careful about what you're comfortable with applying to the flower. Some things decay very rapidly, some compounds that are insecticidal, like pyrethrin, for example. But then I've worked with people who get it and then they get some additive like piperinol butoxide, which a lot of places don't want to apply on their plants and they get uh, yeah. a problem like that. So it's, it's important to do all of your research and footwork prior to actually having flowers on here because uh, what I've been trying to do this season is have my IPM set so I have the leaves coated and a good defense for when these things actually flower because I'm trying not to spray anything on here but I have had to apply BT and the the plant therapy, I like that because it doesn't leave an oily residue and it has a lot of natural oils and stuff. So I also like to use predatory mites and I see that you also have some help here. This is a lacewing uh, egg. You can, you can tell because they put the eggs on this little pedestal, this little like mm. thread and that protects it from predators and other sorts of problems. Okay. So yeah, you would uh, point out this lacewing egg here. So that's, that's a good sign. Not all bugs are bad, huh? That's a predatory bug. Yeah, and it looks, it kind of looks from this distance like it already hatched. So mm. there may be a little lacewing larva walking around on the foliage here. Yeah, it can be, in the larval stage, there's a lot of things that look similar, like some of the leaf miners that we had talked about. You can get a variety of species that will burrow into the leaves, and you can't really tell until they develop what it actually is. So 
is um, the, the IPM that I'm using, like with the plant therapy, the regalia and the BT, is that gonna negatively affect any of these beneficial bugs? In some cases that might be the case, but like for example with regalia, um, you know, I think that's a lot more of a sort of a safer product to use. You wouldn't really expect that as much. Yeah. Um, you know, it's important to know kind of the, the major group that they're a part of. Insects will be maybe resi uh, susceptible to certain insecticidal agents and mites mm. might not be affected as much. Some substances will affect both, but... Um, yeah, well, I, that, I like the plant therapy too because it, it, it'll kill mold and some, uh, it'll contact kill some young uh, bugs that are a problem for these plants. And, and this plant over here, this is what I was talking about with these kind of secondary mold infections. So once it, it pierces the plant's cellular walls, it leaves it open to infection. So what I've, what I've got here are like some caterpillar damage and you can see in the interior of the bud, it looks like some botrytis. So that's, um, that's why I'm spraying the regalia to try to combat this, you know, like a, a multi-pronged uh, plan. So One of the major struggles with botrytis in general is that um, it, uh, it can colonize the plant sort of systemically. And there's even some plants, we're not sure about cannabis, but uh, that it can even pass into the seeds. Mm. and live in the plant and it's basically dormant until the plant bolts, reproductive tissues develop and apparently and botrytis oftentimes just infects those or majorly those parts of the plant. And it can get into the soil too so would it be a good idea with like either BT or the fungicides to also treat the soil when you do that as well? When I do what? Uh, when I'm when I'm spraying my plants, is it a good idea to apply that to the to the actual plants and the soil as well? Oh, I see what you're saying. You know, I don't think it's necessarily important unless you see symptoms or you have a reason to really suspect that that's an issue. Mm. If you're already dealing with certain uh, fungi, that might be a really good idea to do. Um, BT wouldn't affect botrytis, for example, but there are certainly other microbes out there that might um, sort of compete or in other ways like sort of attenuate the uh, botrytis that might potentially get into the spores in your soil or other parts of your cultivation space. Well, and that's part of keeping a, a kind of a living soil biome and having healthy microbes in there to, uh, because it's, it's kind of, a, they're com out competing each other, right? So if you have a healthy, amount of, of good stuff in the soil, you're not gonna get those expressions of, of damaging fungus and pests typically, right? Oh, it's such a complicated, you know, um, world. But yeah, there are all kinds of organisms out there. And, you know, people will think like one season to another season, like they'll apply one thing and they'll think, oh, that must have been it. But there's probably all kinds of things yeah. that they're not accounting for. Yeah, so I guess uh, to wrap this up, just having a, a multi-pronged approach and having a varied IPM plan for your, for your cannabis garden would be the best way to approach these things, right? Because there's resistances that can develop. You can have a variety of pests and one, there's no one cure-all for everything. I completely agree. You want to leverage as many advantages on your side and the plant side and as many disadvantages on the pest side. Yeah, well, it's a complicated thing, but to keep on top of it, that's going to give you the best result in the end. So I appreciate you coming by and talking with us and uh, hope to see you again very soon. I look forward to and it. And we'll see you guys next week. All right. Uh, so if you want to see more videos, make sure to like and subscribe on our main channel on YouTube.